us pray. We are at your feet, Jesus of Nazareth. You are the Christ of God, and this is your word. And as we read this word, we ask first that you would still our hearts and exclude from our hearts and minds any voice except your own, and that hearing your voice in the scripture and in the preaching of your word, we would trust you more deeply, and we would go forth from this place to be your witnesses. Amen. Well, friends, good morning. I'm Donald Marsden from Frontier Fellowship. I'll say a bit more about what we do, who we are, and what we do, but right now, let's read. First, uh, we have three readings. The first is from chapter 11 of the second book of Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking upon the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am with child. Our second reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and designated Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among the nations, including yourselves who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. And finally, from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Well, friends, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I serve with Frontier Fellowship. We are, we are guided by a vision for every people and indigenous church and for every church a mission vision. You could come tonight to Anderson Auditorium on the campus of Westminster College to hear our executive director, Richard Haney. Uh, he's going to be speaking at 7 o'clock tonight in Anderson Auditorium. Um, you, you could also see there Dave Dawson, your former um, executive presbyter from Shenango, Presby per, from Shenango Presbytery. Dave is our chairman. He's the chairman of our board and uh, a wonderful friend. He'll be there as well. Um, I, I notice an oddity about New Wilmington, Pennsylvania, and that is that for 116 years, every summer, except last summer, 
Uh, it's been a place where mission leaders have gathered people to train and inspire young people and to send them out into the world to serve in Christian mission. Now, this kind of thing is done in many places around the world, in many countries, but to my knowledge, there's no other place in the world where it's been done consistently for 116 years. And I'm aware that your congregation came into existence more than 100 years before the New Wilmington Mission Conference got started. And people in this congregation might be justified in thinking, who are these newcomers with their mission conference? What are these people doing? And one might also ask the question, why in New Wilmington, of all places with its Amish buggies, uh, a kind of backwater place where well, when one considers maybe a place closer to Pittsburgh and its international airport uh, or some conference center near some other international airport, why, why New Wilmington of all places? Um, I've been coming to this conference off and on for 20 years, mostly on, um, and I'm aware that it's New Wilmington Presbyterian Church that flies the banner for this mission conference more than you do, but I'm here today because Howard Gaston, he was sitting there a minute ago, Howard Gaston is my friend, he's up in the balcony. <laughs> Howard Gaston is my friend and he agreed to my request to come share the word of God with you today and I'm glad to be with you. I want to explore two questions with you this morning. The first question is, what is Christian mission? And the second question is, why do we do it? Why mission? You know, Christian mission, I'm sure you know, has its critics. And I want to begin by speaking about what Christian mission is not, or must not be. The critics of Christian mission say that it's a kind of an aggressive, arrogant undertaking in which rich and powerful people, rich and powerful nations, maybe religious zealots, if you will, seek to promote and propagate their beliefs on poorer and weaker peoples in the world simply because they have the wealth and they have the time and maybe they like to travel to exotic places. We read in the second book of Samuel, chapter 11, that in the spring of the year, the time when kings go forth to battle, David sent Joab and his servants, his, his soldiers with him, and all Israel to wage war against the Ammonites. David himself, David himself, although he was a highly accomplished military leader, did not go. He stayed back in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, David abused his power and authority as king in an adulterous affair with the wife of one of his most loyal and bravest soldiers, Uriah the Hittite. The whole history here relates the arrogant and callous abuse of power. Kings have power and it seems that they have an appetite for exercising power, like politicians, expanding power. So in the spring, they go to battle with other kings the way maybe today men go out hunting during deer season. But David had become bored with military adventures and instead he decided to chase women. David still engaged in battle by sending his troops, it seems, because going into battle is what is expected of kings in the spring. You know, it's an all bad news story. And in a cynical turn of mind, one might think that missionaries and mission leaders gathering in New Wilmington, again this July for the 116th year, might be a similar kind of thing. Something that just you just do it every year because we've always done it every year. Um, but it's, it's something impersonal. David himself didn't participate in the battle. He sent his soldiers. Something misguided, something that in the end is doomed. Well, this is what mission should not be. That would be a mistake to think that that's the essence of what mission is because 
while any kind of human undertaking can become a form of abuse, the call to serve in God's mission comes from Jesus Christ himself. And we need to remember that. There are plenty of stories I can tell you about the abuse of power in the history of missions. Let me tell you one, the church mission um, society from, um, from Great Britain was formed toward the end of the uh, 18th century. They realized that missionaries needed to learn the, the local languages of the people. And they'd spent a long time training uh, missionaries. They even couldn't find British pastors who would go. They recruited some Germans uh, who were willing to learn Greek and Hebrew and Latin as well as the local African language. They did the best they could to teach them, train them for a long time. They sent three missionaries to, to Africa. Those first three missionaries that were sent, the, one of them was recruited by the local Anglican congregation to serve as their pastor in Africa. They said, we need a pastor. You're a pastor, you come and serve us. He was not, he was basically, uh, they, they just grabbed him and took him, kept him from serving as a missionary. A second one became an atheist and returned to Scotland to lecture on atheism in Scotland. A third one became a slave trader. And with what a record of failure. In spite of beginnings like that for the mission in Africa, Africa today is the, the continent most alive with Christian people. It's just bursting with Christian people today. Way more, there are more Anglicans in Nigeria today than in all of Great Britain, Canada, United States, and Australia combined. Anglicans in Nigeria. So abuse and misunderstanding has been part of the sad history of missions across the years, but that's not its essence. In spite of that, Jesus continues to make his name known throughout the earth. Writing to the Christians in Rome, Paul states that he is an apostle called by Jesus Christ. I am one sent, an apostle, a missionary, set apart for the gospel of God by Jesus Christ, whom God raised from the dead. Through this same Jesus Christ, Paul says, we have received grace and apostleship. Now, what does Paul mean by apostleship? What is apostleship? Apostleship could be, it could mean a status. It would be a very high status, something above being a pastor or an evangelist or even a bishop, something maybe like a super reverend. N no, that will not do. Um, you know, I remember from the musical drama, Jesus Christ Superstar, a chorus, where one of them sings, I always hoped that I'd be an apostle. I knew that I could make it if I try. Then when we retire, we can write the gospel so they'll still talk about us when we die. No, that's, that's not a, what apostleship is about. Apostleship could be understood as an office, the responsibility of being an initiator of Christian mission. An apostle is one who inspires others with new ideas and organizes a new movement. Well, this is getting closer, and it's true enough, but it's still not adequate. But when Paul says we have received grace and apostleship from Jesus Christ our Lord to bring about obedience of faith for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ among the nations, he's saying that Jesus Christ has placed upon him an inescapable burden of responsibility of mission. And this is what the disciple Ananias from Damascus learned when the Lord spoke to him and sent him to minister to Saul, who had been blinded on the road to Damascus as he was on his way to round up Christians and take them prisoner, imprison them, and torture them. Ananias objected. He said, Master, you can't be serious. Everybody's talking about this man and the terrible things he's been doing. 
his reign of terror against your people in Jerusalem, and, and now he's shown up here with papers from the chief priests that give him license to do the same thing here. But the master said, don't argue. Go. I have picked him as my personal representative to heathen and kings and Jews, and now I'm about to show him what he's in for, the hard suffering that goes with this job. So mission is a duty, it's a charge that God places on us, an inescapable obligation. Paul says, necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. I'm compelled to do it, and I'm doomed if I don't. So why mission? Jesus says, follow me. And to follow Jesus Christ means that inescapably I'm consigned, I'm commissioned into his service. He grabs me by the scruff of the neck and he says, I want you to serve me. He doesn't force us, he invites, but there's really no back door to slip out. In the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 23, we read that Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. He said, peace be with you as the Father sent me, even so I send you. He came very close to them. He breathed on them. They could feel the warmth of his breath and they could, sell, they could smell the sweet fragrance of the aroma of his breath. He breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Why mission? Because Jesus himself sends us. Jesus himself sends us. He comes very close to us. He breathes into us his life. He imparts his spirit to us. He says, I have called you my friends. He said, you are my friends if, I do, if you do what I command you. And he sends us to do his mission with him and with others who believe in him, whom he has called his friends. Now I want to tell you a story now from a book called The Great Game by Peter Hopkirk. It's a history of the encounter between the British and the Russians as they vied for power over 300 years in Central Asia. Now, this is, you'll notice that the words I'm using here are taken from a book. It's got a more of a literary flavor, but I decided to use these words because it, you can't say it better than this author. On a morning in June 1842 in the Central Asian town of Bukhara, two ragged figures could be seen kneeling in the dust in the great square before the Emir's palace. Their arms were tied tightly behind their backs, and they were in a pitiful condition, filthy and half-starved. Their bodies were covered with sores. Their hair and beards and clothes were alive with lice. Not far away were two freshly dug graves which the men had been made to dig for themselves. And looking on in silence was a small crowd of Boharans. Normally executions attracted little attention in this remote and still medieval caravan town because under the emir's vicious and despotic rule, they were all too frequent. But this one was different. The two men kneeling in the blazing midday sun were British officers. The two men, Colonel Charles Stoddart and Captain Arthur Connolly, were about to face death together. The two men had been sent three years apart by the British government to forge an alliance with the emir against Russia. Uh, they had hoped to form an alliance and in so doing to abolish the slave trade, but things had gone terribly wrong. They were taken to be spies who had come to deceive and overthrow the emir of Bukhara. Now, Colonel Stoddart was the first to be beheaded he was a brave soldier, but not a good diplomat. He had suffered in the emir's dungeons and prisons off and on for three years. He had converted to Islam under the threat of death. Before being beheaded, he loudly denounced the tyranny of the emir. The executioner turned to Captain Connolly, 
who told him that the emir had offered to spare his life if he would renounce Christianity and embrace Islam. Aware that Stoddard's forcible conversion to Islam had not saved him from imprisonment and death, Connolly, a devout Christian, replied, Colonel Stoddard has been a Muslim for three years and you killed him. I will not become one and I am ready to die. And so he stretched out his neck and a moment later his head rolled in the dust beside that of his friend. Now why am I telling you this story? These men were not Christian missionaries. They had traveled to Bukhara on government business hoping to form an alliance with the emir and build a, a, an alliance against Russia, abolish the slave trade. Their purpose was to secure advantages for the British Empire against the Russians, but they failed completely. In the end, it was the Russians who conquered and ruled all of Central Asia, and later Central Asia became a part of the Soviet Union. Now, in the thinking of that time, Central Asia was too dangerous a place to send missionaries. Both the British and the Russians believed that barbarous peoples like those of Bukhara needed to be civilized before they could be evangelized. And that's one of the reasons you had missionaries early on in India where the British ruled. These people at that time saw the mission of civilizing and evangelizing as going hand in hand. They were inseparable. What I'd like to say, though, that in his own way, at least one of these men did bear witness to Jesus Christ. And that his witness made an impact on somebody who observed his execution that day. And here's why I'm saying that. About 20 years later, after the execution, the sister of Captain Arthur Connolly, living in London, received a small parcel in the mail. It had been mailed to her by somebody living in St. Petersburg, Russia, who had obtained it. And when learning what it was, he tracked her down and mailed it to her. The parcel contained a battered prayer book which had been in her brother's possession throughout his captivity. In the blank pages at the end of that prayer book and in the margins, he had written his account of their ordeal. And the entries ended abruptly in mid-sentence. Now in my understanding, that says that with all the confusions of politics and co uh, colonialization and colonialism and of uh, governments vying for power, a man who was not a missionary but he was a Christian, witness to Christ, and his witness was honored. The people who organized his executions could, his execution could easily have burned his prayer book, or they could have thrown it into the grave where they threw him, and it would have rotted with his body, but they preserved the prayer book. In fact, not only did they preserve it, but they delivered it to responsible people who eventually sent it to the man's sister in London. So in that stronghold of Islam, Bukhara is the place where the famous Imam al-Bukhari lived. He compiled the genuine sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, which are compiled in a book called the Hadith, which is a book that is revered by Muslims as the most holy book after the Quran, the people of that town witnessed a Christian who was ready to die for his faith and who, um, and th that witness made an impression on them such that they saved his prayer book and they delivered it to people who were their enemies, the Russians. I'm also telling you this story because I know and I work with some wonderful Christian men and women of the Uzbek people. Bukhara is an ancient town in Uzbekistan today. I work with some wonderful Christian men and women of the Uzbek people who were born in Muslim families but have embraced Jesus Christ.
in our time. I've visited them. I was with some of them two years ago. My last trip overseas was in March of 2019, and I was with a number of these men and women in Turkey, uh, and I've been regularly talking with them by Zoom these past two years. They're my friends. They've become my friends. Just as Howard Gaston is one of my friends, these people are my friends. And I'd like to tell you that the percentage of Christians in that country is growing, but I can't tell you that. The percentage of Christians is less than 1%, and the percentage is getting smaller, even though people are turning to Jesus. It's still a really, really, really tough place to be a Christian, as it was for those British officers, but the Christian movement has found a foothold, not only among Russian-speaking people, because the Russians ruled that country for years, and they established their churches there, and there are Russian-speaking churches. It's not too hard to be a Russian Christian in that, that country, but to be an Uzbek Christian, it can be very rough. Now this year, we're working in partnership with them to, to help them start new churches. I've been, I've been out hiking. I did something called the Frontier Mission Trek, in which I've been hiking. I hiked fr from my house to various churches to tell about Frontier Mission, about the challenge, about the need for it. And in, in, in my hikes, I asked people to support a project we call the Springs of Water Church Planting Initi Initiative in Central Asia, in which we have provided money for uh, water filtration systems that evangelists are taking into towns, into towns in Uzbekistan where there's no Christian witness, no church, and they are setting up a, a small family business filtering water everywhere in Central Asia. There's water that's unfit to drink. They're filtering water and selling it in the marketplace. And by so doing, they establish a platform in the community for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And so um, in these hikes, and I've, I've hiked um, three miles to churches from my house. I've hiked 44 miles from Harrisonburg Virginia to Waynesboro, Virginia. I hiked recently with 10 uh, Boy Scouts uh, from the Trail Life and four other adult leaders. We hiked 115 miles the entire length of the Shenandoah National Park. And the boys sent out um, requests to their family and friends. They raised $5,500 toward this project. Why am I doing that, that hiking? Well, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a friend of Howard. We like hiking. We like outdoors. But I want people to understand that Frontier Mission is a slow kind of work. It takes perseverance. It takes patience. It takes stick to -itiveness. And that's why I've been kind of acting out a prayer for my friends in Uzbekistan through these hikes. So why mission? Why mission? Because it's an inescapable consequence of belonging to and following Jesus Christ. Because Jesus calls us his friends. And when he calls us his friends, he invites us to become friends and to become joined to his friends in places around the world where it's tough to follow Jesus. He desires us to collaborate with his friends. Jesus sends us and he goes with us. He doesn't send us off and stay in Jerusalem. No, he goes with us. And in spite of all the mistakes and all the blunders in the history of mission, Jesus is still in charge. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the Lord of the harvest. And for centuries, you have been sending out your workers into the fields of harvest. Jesus, you call us your friends. Help us to find our place. Help us to join hands with your friends throughout the world to serve you. Your, strengthen this congregation in their mission here in New Wilmington and join us to those around the world who serve you. We ask it in your great name, amen.
Friends, uh, let's say together the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, please stand. If you stand during the Apostles' Creed, please stand. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please remain standing as we sing How Firm a Foundation.